Hi, welcome to this week's edition of PHQ Questions from the Personality Hacker community. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And Addison, let's get right to our question today. Hi, Joel and Antonia. I've been voraciously consuming your content as of late and couldn't help but wonder the following as I haven't yet come across any podcasts that cover this. I'm a sports guy, so I'd be fascinated to hear a personality hacker's take on this. When athletes succumb to pressure and buzzer beater end game scenarios, would you consider this a function of devolving to 10 or 3 year old positions where all 16 types possess equal susceptibility pressure? Assuming, of course, by factors such as skill competency, veteran versus rookie status, comfort level with running the offense, etc., are equal, or vulnerability to pressure packed end game scenarios correlate more reliably with cognitive function? Does this sound interesting enough for a riff? maybe even a full-length podcast? I'm well aware of content on the site regarding behavior that emerges out of the 10-year-old and 3-year-old states, but can we assume that these 16 types succumb to pressure identically when exposed to the uniform stimulus of fourth quarter, down by three with 10 seconds to go till the buzzer? Okay, so if I've got this right, the question is when athletes succumb to pressure, are they going to their 10-year-old and 3-year-old positions? And do all athletes succumb under pressure the same way? Is that is that what you got? Sort of. <laughs> it's, it's an extremely sophisticated question, I think. Yeah, it, it really was. And I think I'm going to answer what I got out of it since I don't actually have the person to clarify it for me. So if I like horribly misunderstood your question and if i've butchered it please let me know we're gonna take a stab at it i'm gonna take a stab at it so as to the first question i i mean okay i'm i'm not a sports person you're more of a sports person than i am joel you're a major football fan and i enjoy football less so since i found out the patriots are big cheaters (laughs) sorry i have to get the dig in because they're cheaters so less so about American football. I'm talking about American football. I, I what it is is it's like now that I know that the NFL is just rife with cheating, regardless of whether or not it's the Patriots or you know or some other team, it makes it a little less interesting to me. That said, I'm just not really an at you know like a sports kind of person, though I very much appreciate I, I appreciate sports as an art. Honestly, I wish I was more familiar with it. I will say though, as like an overarching principle, yeah, when we are under pressure, we devolve. I mean, not, excuse me, when we devolve, we go to our inferior processes. That's actually more accurate. Not everybody under pressure devolves, and that's the second portion of this question. So the first portion is when we devolve, when we are succumbing to massive pressure, where do we go? And it's usually the 10-year-old and the 3-year-old. The reason being that the 10-year-old is a defensive position. It's where we shore up, you know, our resources and defenses against the world, trying to, you know, try what we perceive as an attack or trying to get at us some way. And then the reason why we have a tendency to go to the three-year-old is because when we are under massive amounts of pressure and we can't handle it, it's been our driver process, right? Like that dominant cognitive function of our type that we've been using to try to solve the problem. We've been trying to solve the issue with that driver process. And if it's just not working, we get really frustrated and our brain needs a moment to rest. I liken it to trying to open a bottle with a screwdriver. Like it can be done, right? Like you can open a bottle cap with a screwdriver, but it's frustrating and difficult. And if you've never done it before, it might take, you know, like some, some trying to figure it out and then some rest because you're annoyed by it and then coming back and trying to figure it out again. So when we are using our driver process, our driver cognitive function, and it's, at the moment, not the right tool for the job, or we've just not figured out how to use that tool for the particular context, we can get extremely frustrated and then we need a break. So what our brain does is it goes, hey, I know the best way to give that cognitive function or that mental process a break. I'm just going to go to its polar opposites, right? And then just let that process chill for a minute while its polar opposite is activated. And that's why when we are in the grip, as Naomi Quink would say, or when we are like at our breaking point, we have a tendency to go to our inferior process or that three-year-old process because it gives our driver or dominant process a couple minutes to chill. So yeah, we do have a tendency when under pressure, not just under pressure, but like truly devolving under pressure. We have a tendency to go to the 10-year-old because it's our defensive strategy and our three-year-old because we're just trying to give that driver process a breather. 
So yes, the answer is yes on that one. Now the question is, do all do all types succumb to pressure? Do they all respond the same way under pressure? And that would be a definite no. Absolutely not. You can see greatly how certain types do much better under pressure. Like, and and I'm defining pressure as like time sensitive and the kind of pressure that you see in athletic activities and sports like you got to get something done you got to get it fast and you've got a lot of like actual physical pressure around you surrounding you a lot of energy like in football somebody's going to come crashing into you in any moment you've got to make sure you throw the ball at the exact right place not where the guy is but where the guy is running right um the guy what is he uh, the wide receiver wide receiver thank you <laughs> so there's there's a lot of physical pressure there a lot of time pressure and there is no question that sensor perceivers, the, those using the, the process of extroverted sensing or what we call sensation, perform so much better than other types in that scenario. And the reason why they perform better is because their brains are designed to perform better. Dario Nardi, in his book, The Neuroscience of Personality, talks about the tennis hop that you'll see in the extroverted sensing process, meaning that if you hook somebody who's an, a sensor perceiver up to an EEG, and give them activities that, you know, pull on the parts of the brain that use extroverted sensing, you'll see that their brain goes into what's called the tennis hop, which is basically the brain's version of being ready for anything. It's like a a tennis player hopping back and forth on their feet, you know, on each foot in anticipation of the ball going anywhere, literally anywhere. And if they're already hopping back and forth, they've already got some momentum built. So no matter where the ball goes, they can just immediately shoot off in that trajectory. And the brain does the same thing when using extroverted sensing or sensation. It does a mental tennis hop, meaning that it is ready at all times for anything to happen. When you're in a situation like that, you are not married to an outcome. You're just excited by activity. You're just like overjoyed that something is happening, something exciting and adrenaline inducing is happening, which is why people of that use extrovert sensing make some of the best performers in all fields, as well as being some of the best negotiators. They sit down at a table and they negotiate the hell out of the situation because they're not married to an outcome. They're just excited by the rush of negotiation. So definitely sensor perceiver types are the best under physical pressure. You know, and I think about you know, if you watch just American football, for example, you'll you'll hear an announcer say a, a quarterback might be like tackled three times, like sacked three times in a row, right? And they'll say, I think they're in his head. They're getting into his head. The other team's got they're they're rattling around in there. He's got to shake this off. He's got to he's got to get out of his head and get back in the game. And you know, I take an example of maybe an ESTP who leads with that sensation process you're talking about. You know, extroverted sensing and what's happening is now he's starting to build a narrative around what this means. He's getting sacked all the time. What's this mean in the grand scheme of the game? And he's actually going to his three-year-old position, most likely, that inferior place, which is introverted intuition. You know, we've we've nicknamed it perspectives. And he's he's trying to guess what the other team's doing and how this is going to play into the bigger picture of the game. And are they going to win? And and when these announcers say he's got to get out of his head, they're basically saying he's got to get back into the present mode of what his skill set is, if he's an ESTP, for example. And it's just one very specific example of this. And so you can see this in sports. And oftentimes they'll talk about, you know, the other team and other teams will do this. They'll try to get into the head and the headspace of the other team to throw them off balance, get them thinking, overthinking the situation or keeping them off balance. And oftentimes athletes are sensation. They're either sensation drivers or sensation co-pilots. That's where they show up to the world in an excellent way. And so oftentimes there are those types and when they say get out of their head, basically they're saying is get out of that place where you're speculating and you're wildly trying to draw conclusions and get back into something that is real for you and tangible and present in the moment. Get into that tennis hot place where you're ready for anything and you just shake it off. Don't worry about the last play. Just keep driving the ball forward. Yeah. So it, it really depends, too, on the kind of sport you're talking about, too. I would say that, you know, games like basketball, right, like that's definitely going to be just filled with sensor perceivers you've got to move so fast and the ball is going so many different directions so quickly and there's I mean that's a high scoring game there's a lot of activity there's lots of back and forth hockey the same way I would say with American football 
you're probably going to see actually a lot of more sensor judgers because it's all about pre-planning the gameplay. It's about knowing exactly what you're supposed to be doing ex- at the exact moment you're supposed to be doing it. And it's about making sure that you fulfill that obligation. So American football actually is probably going to have more sensor judgers than sensor perceivers. And as long as a sensor ju- judger can like perform exactly the way that they've been told to perform and they've done it a million bajillion times, right? They've just run that play and run that play and run that play. Then they're probably not going to be easy to rattle either because they know what they're doing and they're going to execute. So it would also depend on the kind of game and the the personality type within that game. So there's going to be some types that are more easily rattled, right? Do worse under pressure in a context that's not designed as much for them as it would be for a different type. So There's, you know, certain types that might get more rattled in American football, but not get rattled at all in basketball and vice versa. So it really depends on the the individual type and the specific game they're playing. I've noticed that uh, extroverted thinking or effectiveness, this is a cognitive function that thinker judgers use. And I've noticed that there's a lot more thinker judgers or effectiveness people in football than there is, say, in one-on-one tennis. Um, I remember doing some coaching with an ESTJ who loved tennis. He'd grown up playing tennis. It was like his greatest passion to be a professional tennis player. And he goes, I don't know why, but I just was never as good as the other person. He's like, I I practiced like crazy. I loved playing it. It was my passion. And I just was always getting outclassed by the other person. He's like, I mean, I made it pretty high up. I did very, very well. And then I just got to that world-class level and I just couldn't push through. And I've noticed that for tennis, who excels at tennis ISTPs. No question. An ISTP seems to outclass everybody else when it comes to tennis because it's a single player game. It's a one-on-one competition. It requires that tennis hop both physically and mentally. And that introverted thinking or accuracy is all about mechanical precision at that point. An ISTP is very unlikely to choke. However, if you take ISTPs and put them in another context, right? I'm I'm trying to think of an example, um, probably something that would be a lot more slow moving, something that would require a lot more, I don't know, like curling maybe. (laughs) I'm trying to think of like a slow moving, you know, group context. Well, you could even think from a coaching standpoint, if they had to coach a football team, I mean, they probably would do a pretty good job, but... You know, ISTP isn't, they're, they're not thinking in strategy, they're thinking in tactics a lot of times. Absolutely. That's actually, that's a great, great uh, example of a position in sports that they might not be fantastic at, but not too bad, right? Like, I mean, I know about baseball coaches that are ISTPs and do a great job. So, so yeah, it just, it depends on the type. I mean, I, I know that a lot of these PHQs ends up with us going, well, it kind of depends. <laughs> and it's because everything is so contextual. It depends on the type. It depends on the particular sport. There are certain types that there's a reason why they have a tendency to outclass everybody else in that particular field. And sensor perceivers, people use sensation, getting inside their body, being adrenaline oriented, not being married to the outcome, being completely grafted to whatever tool they're using. These are, there's a reason why they tend to outclass everybody else in sports. And unless, like you said, unless somebody gets in their head and pulls them into perspectives, which is not their strength, they're going to be, they're just going to do great under pressure. So yeah, I mean, there are types that, some types that have a tendency to choke more than other types. I've noted ENTJs in sports. Uh, I know that they, um, I know an ENTJ that was great in soccer or what everybody else on the planet calls football. Um, he was fantastic and he even played professionally and yeah, he choked a couple times <laughs> and it was because he was an ENCJ. He did great. He had effectiveness. He had sensation as a 10 year old. He did fantastic, but it just, there, there, there are some types that are going to outperform other types, even though I would argue that probably just about any type can play just about any sport, but there are going to be things that like barnacles that hang on to them around their type that they're going to have to work through. So anyway, that's my, it depends. It's contextual, probably not very helpful answer around the idea of sports, athletes, and choking. Thanks for the question. If you've got a question, you can come over to personalityhacker.com forward slash questions. There's a form you can ask your question there or record a question and we can edit it into the beginning of the PHQ and then answer it from there. Uh, these 
These questions and answers are coming out every Thursday here on the main podcast channel, and we'd love to entertain some ideas you have around whether it's personality type. We love talking about personal growth and how we can grow as people, so that's another great question you can ask anything around personal growth, and we'd love to uh, talk with you further. You can also join our community of growing people, uh, growing people, people that are growing uh, personally. <laughs> personally growing, personal development growth. Personal development growth. Not like they're growth. actually physically growing, although that is also possible. <laughs> Which is probably the case, too, in some cases. I don't know. Uh, over at Facebook.com forward slash Personality Hacker or Twitter.com forward slash Personality Hack. And, of course, you can find a plethora of resources and information over at PersonalityHacker.com, our main website channel. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. We can't wait to talk with you on the next PHQ, Questions from the Personality Hacker community.